continuing through our series together, looking at the seven days of creation, and we are uh, now up to day five. We are seeing that the Lord has been taking what was void, and now he's shaping it, has shaped it, and now he's beginning to fill that void. And so day five, we find a new, brand new entity that has come into being, as we'll see from the text. I've mentioned every time I start this a message from this series that this is a controversial text, uh, even amongst believers. Um, even what I'm saying this morning would um, raise some eyebrows uh, amongst some people, and we just have to discuss it through and talk it through and hopefully come to uh, see what the Word of God has to say, because that's ultimately where we stand and where we fall. Um, the, be the text begins, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The way that you are going to read this text is going to be dependent on the filter that you read this through. And there are very many ways that people look at this text based on their worldview and their particular point of view. If you approach this text from a worldview of atheism, it says there is no God, then clearly you would look at this text and you would say, well, this is just a nice idea that the Hebrews had up. This was their mythology and this was the beginning, and, but it doesn't really mean anything and you don't take it seriously. If you approach this from an agnostic point of view, looking at this through uh, the eyes of agnosticism, which says, I don't know if God exists, then you would probably have some doubts. You're not sure. You are not can't know anything about this. It's just an interesting text. It could be, maybe not. I don't know how you want to look at this. If you were George Lucas, uh, who has borrowed the ideas of pantheism into uh, his uh, Star Wars stories uh, with the force that everything is God, and you would look, look at this and you would probably be, uh, I don't know how you would approach this, because suddenly this is a personal God that's presented here. This would contradict your worldview. This, this would somehow you'd have to fit this into the idea, but, but everything is just nature is God. God is nature. It's not a personal being. It's just a force that's out there that kind of oversees and makes things happen. You know, weather and nature and all that's happening in the world. It just happens of itself. It is God itself, but it's not personal. That's pantheism. Polytheism says, of course, many Eastern mysticism or Eastern religions rather, um, rely on polytheism, that there are many gods, multiplicity of gods. As you'd approach this book, you'd say, well, that's just the Christian God. But there are still other gods. When you read the text, you would see it that way. Dualism, which would say that there are two gods, there are only two gods, there's good versus evil, they are equal. ...against each other, and you would read this text perhaps, and you would see the good God on the one side and the bad God on the other side, and you would see that dualism by the time you get to chapter 3. Every point of view... Uh, it's a pair of glasses that you read this book through. Deism, which uh, arrived in the 17th, 18th century, um, was really the, is really, we still feel the, the, the ramifications of this point of view, even to this day through uh, modernism. Um, but God can't control everything. So deism, which I, I want to pause here for just a little bit longer here, because there's a lot of Christians who are deists, who don't realize that they're actually deists. Just listen to this. Deism is an idea that God started the universe, and he began it, and he wound it up, and now it's just let it go. He wound it up, he set the laws of nature in place, and now they're just running themselves out. And so the laws of nature would just take over and do what they do, and so nature maybe would produce nature, and things would happen, but God has stepped back from this. Christians talk like this when they try to fit, in my opinion, when they try to fit long ages into this text. That somehow they begin to see that there's a need for time that God needs to have. That there is uh, some position that God's taken to build this system, build a system, and now he's just stepped back from it. Christians sound like deists when they talk about the weather that God can't control. That there's a hurricane that went through that has nothing to do with him. Poor God is a victim of the storm that happened that wiped out some people. As if God is just, you know, at, at his wit's end what to do about this. He's wound the thing up and now it's running on its own. That is not a Christian worldview. That is not the God of the Bible. And if you read this text through the eyes of deism, it is not a difficulty to begin to meld human ideas with the biblical text and begin to somehow feel like we need to satisfy, perhaps it's our own agenda, our own uh, career at, on the line. Somehow we've got to uh, placate this, the world that says, no, it's got to be this way. We are not deists. We are theists. We see a God who has, from the beginning, had control over all things, who from the beginning speaks things into being and controls all things. We just sang a verse to a song that I don't have the words memorized, 
but we exist in him was basically the idea of this the text that we sang that all things exist because of him and he is through all in all he is the very essence of nature itself he's above nature he's transcended from nature but he is in all and through all and controls all and we see that clearly as we begin to look at this text again in verse 20 of chapter 1 God speaks and again the same principle we've seen throughout this text all it takes is this God who is so grand and so mighty that all he does is speak and it happens and God said let the waters swarm with swarms it's an interesting expression this is a literary device a Hebrew way of emphasizing a picture in your mind it's swarms with swarms that's a very strange thing to say but that is exactly what the text says and let the waters swarm with swarms and instantaneously it would appear by God's design by the very words that he spoke that's all it took that the waters teemed with life this is a brand new thing prior to this what God had created was a solar machine a plant it works for the purpose of producing seeds or producing fruit but suddenly there is a brand new thing that has never been it gets a whole different classification in fact it is to swarm with swarms of living things this delineates this kind of life from plant life there is something in this life that gets a different description of being a living thing the word living is this famous Hebrew word nephesh, which has the idea of the word soul or breath. It is um, not just to differ differentiate, and so you, you understand it's, it's got nothing to do with an eternal soul. That's not the idea of this word. It has to do with the animation of a thing, that something has being and, and, and some personality, and perhaps even a... a, a um, uh, some measure of a spinal cord and, and this kind of a, uh, an electrical system that works it and makes things function within it. That's the idea of this word. And these are what these are called. It's called a, a living thing. This is why we have no concern that we're killing plants when we eat carrots. We don't worry that we're causing them pain. They were never described as nephesh. But suddenly there are creatures. This is the first time in the creation week that something like this has taken place. There is a new step, ultimately a step towards the ultimate creation, which will be the human race, but a new step in creation that out of nothing, God said, let there be, and suddenly there was something that could move, something that was independent, something that had decisions to make, something that would ultimately procreate. This was a brand new thing on the scene. We talk about these swarms of swarms. Our minds immediately go to the fish of the sea and all the multiplicity of species that we find in the ocean. We think even of dolphins and whales and manatees and porpoises and everything else in between and, and platypuses and everything that's in the ocean and in the seas. We think of that, but we often don't think of the fact that he also in that moment would have created every unseen thing. This is actually a picture, a slide from an electron microscope, I believe. It's a few drops of seawater magnified 25 times. None of this is visible to your naked eye, but when you look at seawater, you find that it is filled with life. You want to know what kind of life? This is what you're looking at. I can't read half those things, but they're real things. Crab larvae, fish eggs, marine worms. I know what those are. Marine worms, how do you fish for marine worms? Do you put a fish on the hook when you're fishing for marine worms? Just a thought I had. All of these things are complex beings. We look at them as if they are lower life forms. In fact, when you examine them, you find out there is incredible machinery built into even the smallest microorganism. All of these things, if you can even begin to put your mind around the kind of a God that is described in the Bible, if you want to be a deist and say that your God can't be this big, then you will have problems with a verse that says that God just spoke and instantaneously all these complex beings existed. Your God, the God of Scripture, as he is revealed, is so great 
and so mighty that he does what for us is insurmountable to even comprehend how that's possible. But this is the God as he's presented in Scripture. He speaks, and all of these systems are in place, and they are functional. Think about, I don't know too much about dolphins, but they are incredible creatures. They are, there's so much intelligence to them from what I'm, I've been told. Cle clearly, I'm not a marine biologist, but you know that they have this ability to echolocate their food, their, their food source. They can send out these clicks into the ocean. And they listen as it comes back to them. And they na now know the distance it is, the size of the object that they're after. All kinds of information comes back to them. How could such a system exist without the mind of a creator? At least that's my question. There's incredible detail in this. There's a system in the, the dolphin that, that rattles to, it vibrates to um, almost bone-like structures together and makes this clicking sound with great speed. It, it, it resonates through its nasal cavities, and then it, 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 through this, it sends that signal out into the ocean. It now comes back, it bounces back. They now have what is called a melon, which is basically the big bulbous part of their, their head, that now receives that, hears that, those clicks, and responds. It gives them that information, and they translate that sound into information that they now receive as information that they can now respond to, and they now know the, the system is so complex, it would have to have been in place all in one go. This is a sign in a uh, major U.S. museum, a display. It says, designed for the depths. This is, you would think, a creation museum, the way it's listed. It's not. The implication here is that nature designed the dolphin without any outside influence. Obviously, clearly, you know, this is a mainstay belief. You grew up in this culture, many of you. You've heard this from infancy. You know the drill. You've watched television. You've seen every documentary. You've had this whole thing and this mantra pounded into your head a million times. You know the drill. You know how this goes. You know the story. You know what naturalism is. That's the, the world religion of our day. It contradicts theism, and it contradicts the scriptures, blatantly. What do you do with that? Here you have a sign that says that nature designed this creature. How did it design this creature? You have to ask that question because evolution, by definition, is doing everything blindly. Anything that it would be building into a system would be completely, absolutely, without any end result in mind. Keep that in mind. So here's a hungry dolphin that needs to find food. It now has no means, there's no ability for now it to blindly wait for nature maybe to come up with some system that maybe it would develop. Blind chance, if you can call it chance, is purposeless. It has no end game. It is just a fluke. Well, they say, well, it just would happen by adaption. Things adapt over time. The problem I would question with this, and clearly I don't know too much about these things, but genetics are hardwired into the system. There's no natural system that we know that changes the genetic makeup of a creature. There's no natural system that allows for a creature to have a new Thing built into the system to pass it on to its offspring. That doesn't happen in nature. Any change in genetic material is called a mutation. These mutations are always steps backwards. They're never steps forward. There's no evidence of a mutation that moves a species forward and then that genetic inf information is... doesn't happen. Information is lost. It is never added in. The only way a dolphin can function as he functions is if all of the systems were in place from the beginning, at the start. That is exactly what the scriptures say. Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. And let the birds fly above the earth, across the expanse of the heavens. And so we have the very same principle. God speaking. And now we have 
another nephish, another living creature, swarms of birds. Let birds fly above the expanse of the heavens. I don't know if you ever paid much attention to a woodpecker. If you've ever had one on the side of your house, you probably have. I have seen videos of people in the forest with woodpeckers on their shoulders pecking at their neck. Kind of a fascinating thing. Makes you wonder what these people are made out of. And that's true. Fascinating bird. These are different. They Most birds have three toes. A woodpecker has four toes, which is perfectly designed, I'm using that word on purpose, designed to position itself and stabilize itself on the side of a tree. It also has unique tail feathers, unique muscles in the back of its tail, and tail feathers that it can manipulate by spreading out or pulling together, and it uses it almost as a third leg to position itself against a tree. Now what's fascinating about a woodpecker, I'll give you some trivia that you don't need to know, a woodpecker can peck a tree up to 500 times a minute. Now, I'm not saying, this is not saying that it does that. Peckers, woodpeckers don't usually go at a tree for a full 60 seconds. Okay? They go and they stop, they go and they stop. But if it were to continue, you would see it in about one minute, it could peck 500 times. That's a lot. Because it's pecking approximately 22 times per second. By the way, when a woodpecker pecks, Every time it strikes, it closes its eyes to keep wood chips out of its eyes. Every time it pulls its head back, it opens its eyes to reposition where it wants to go again, then closes its eyes. It does that 22 times in a second. It's pecking at an enormous rate. Now, you might think, well, that's just fascinating. It is. But when you think about the fact that it's doing this at a fixed rate, at approximately 21 kilometers an hour. Now, might not mean like a lot, might not sound like a lot. You can run at approximately, I'm going to say seven kilometers an hour if you're really good, okay? So run yourself into a tree as fast as you can, 22 times in a second, and tell me what your head feels like. And this creature gives no thought to doing what is built into the system to put itself on the side of the tree and launch its head. Full stop! Bam! Well, that full stop causes the head of this woodpecker to be subject to about a thousand times the force of gravity. If you've ever been on a roller coaster and you've ever felt that pressure of you trying to lift your arms on the loop or get your head back up that feels like this 50-pound melon, you're experiencing about four times the force of gravity, g-force of four. A jet fighter, uh, somewhere between six and ten times the force of gravity. They have to wear suits because blood begins to go and it's where it shouldn't, it doesn't go into your head, all these things happen to your body and your system, they have to because the force of gravity has changed. Try throwing your head against a tree 22 times a second at 1,000 times the force of gravity. Tell me that you would not have some brain damage. By the way, if you want to know the math, that is the equivalent of coming to a complete stop from a moving position, moving at approximately 41,800 kilometers an hour. Now, that's not how fast the head of the uh, woodpecker goes. That's just, you know, relative to speaking to us. This is an enormously, intensely, incredible creature that we just take for granted. So we see this thing on the side of the tree, we see it going to work, and we don't realize the intricate connection that this, the systems that this thing would have had to have in place for it to simply do what it naturally does. The first woodpecker would have got on that tree and said, I think there's a bug here. Bang his head, fall over dead, without any chance of passing on that gene to any other species. The first woodpeckers, if they didn't have the system built in, would have immediately died. You say, well, one of them must have had a really strong head, and it lived, and somehow that passed on. Okay, did you know that we study woodpeckers to figure out how to make better crash helmets? Did you know that? They have a better system 
than we can figure out with our natural science. Their brains are put in there with the bone structure, everything that they've got about them is unsurpassed in nature. Their system is better than any system that we know, and it happened, as the story goes, by chance. No, no. The Bible says this had to be built in from the beginning in order for this system to function. Here's a woodpecker, bangs his head against the wall. Let's suppose he lives. Now he says, I want to reach that bug, but the bug is too far down there. I need a really long tongue to reach that bug. So he dies because he doesn't have a long tongue. Now how does a woodpecker that doesn't develop a long tongue ever get to the bug? But the woodpeckers that we know actually have a tongue that is so long if you see a woodpecker stick his tongue out in proportion to us, it's like two feet long. It's not actually two feet, but in proportion to your body. It's a massive tongue. The tongue of a woodpecker, you might not know this, but actually is spiked on the end. It has little barbs on the end of it. So that when it pierces its tongue into the hole, it can actually grab a hold of that insect. Now, it doesn't always work. So there's another mechanism that the tongue has that it actually produces an adhesive at the end of the tongue. So as it pierces the insect, it secretes glue into that insect to now hold on to it as it pulls it out of the, the, out of the, the tree trunk. So it doesn't, you know, the, the hole is small. So the friction of it pulling through the hole doesn't, doesn't lose his, his meal. So now this woodpecker has another problem. The first woodpeckers who developed all of these systems would have got the bug into their mouth and swallowed the bug and swallowing their tongue in the process because the bug is glued to their tongue. But conveniently enough, there's a system in the woodpecker's mouth that the moment the tongue comes in, it secretes another chemical to, to loosen the gum so that the gum, that the glue is now released and the bug is free to come off of his tongue. Both of these systems would have had to be in place simultaneously for any woodpecker to exist today. There's no explanation except God put all of these systems in place from the very start. We are looking at the mind of a creator who saw and foresaw all that was necessary. That is one creature of a myriad of creatures that he spoke into existence in a moment. And they all had functional, independent, functional mechanisms to survive. Think about the hummingbird, our most popular little creature. Which, by the way, the hummingbird's feathers, from what I understand, are phosphorescent in the sun. They, they have colors in the sun. When the sun goes down and there's no light on them, they aren't colorful. Prey can't see them in the dark. How convenient is that? Woodpeckers, or sorry, hummingbirds um, nests. I don't know if you've ever seen one. They're about the size of a quarter, 25 cent piece. These things are engineering marvels. Um, they are mostly made, the, the, the product of choice that a hummingbird uses, from what I've been told, is a uh, spider web. And it prefers this for some reason. I'm not sure, perhaps its strength and um, the fact that it's, you know, soft and comfy. It'll build this thing, and you know, it balances them on the most ridiculous places you could ever imagine putting one, and it builds in to the side of the nest. It will build in pebbles or sticks or things that it needs to balance that nest so that there's more weight on one side than the other side, so it knows. It has the engineering capability to know. I need more weight here because when I sit on this side, it'll flip onto the ground if I don't make this right. It knows exactly how did it learn this? How did birds learn to migrate? Have you ever seen starling murmurations as they're known? These are famous. They're so strange and wonderful at the same time. Starlings do not email each other to say it's time to get together. And yet they know exactly where to be, when to be. Did you know, and by the way, when um, prey comes into starling, these are called murmurations, when they come into these flocks and they try to attack a, a hawk or something, these little creatures, all they do is swarm the hawk and confuse the bejesus out of it, pardon my expression, and they have no idea where they are. They're just completely confused and lost and bewildered, and they leave because of 
um, what they're doing. These things, by the way, um, uh, birds, among other birds, when they migrate, it has been discovered that during their first summer of life, they learn the position of the stars in the sky. And when the stars in the sky click back into that position, the birds know it's time for us to move. What? They memorize the stars? Who taught them how to do this? How could such a thing be? The concepts of migration and where animals are and how they are, fascinating subject. I'm not trying to bore you to tears with details that don't matter. Lola is saying, the complexity of nature, as I see it, goes far beyond the ability of a natural mechanism to create what we have now. There is intelligence in this design, and it had to be there from the start. So God, verse 21, created. Just pointing this out to you because this is the same word from Genesis 1.1. Talked about this word, bara. It means he created out of nothing. That's the text. There's no room for one species to become another species with that word in the text. God created. The idea of this word is to take something that does not exist, there's no materials that you're using, and suddenly something is that was not. He barad, to put it into an English word. He created out of nothing. That's what the text says. He created, this is a summary. So God created the great sea creatures. Why is sea creatures mentioned here? I think one of the reasons for this, um, commentators tell us, is because in the ancient Near East, it was very much thought that the sea creatures of the deep were the place where the, often place, often the place where the gods lived. The sea creatures of the deep were the real creatures that ran and rule, ruled over the earth. And in fact, this Hebrew idea has been carried over, and I've mentioned this many times, but the sea is seen in the Bible from a Jewish point of view to be the place of murkiness, the place of darkness, the place of the unknown. It's used in the Psalms in this poetic way. It's used in the book of Revelation. The beast comes up out of the sea. That's where you would expect the beast to come because it's all the murky depths of Anything that's, they don't know what's down there. They couldn't explore it. They couldn't see it. They were landlubbers. And the ancient Near East believed that anything down there, that's where the great creatures lived. The gods that they had names for, Tanin um, was one, a very famous uh, god of Babylonian mythology that embodied all of evil. Do you know what this text says? The reason that this text says it this way? So God created the great sea creatures. And the, the Hebrew Bible is claiming to all other nations who have these fanciful mythological ideas of what's in the sea, that this God is over your gods. This God put all of those things there. This God rules over all the creatures of the sea. We don't have any such foolish notions today. But the Bible claimed for centuries to all nations at all times, God created out of nothing great sea creatures and every living creature that moves. So again, just an underlining. The nephish, this intelligence, this personality, this ability to function, this electrical device that moves and, and replicates and eats and sleeps and thinks. This device, this machine, it came from God. That's the claim. Every thing that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, every winged bird according to its kind. This is again, talked about this, setting the parameters of how far a kind can go. So we'll never see, as we are told today in modern thinking, that the manatee came from the elephant. That a manatee is just a relation of the elephant. Over time, adaption and changes, natural processes, a manatee becomes an elephant, or an elephant becomes a manatee. That's their story. Can't see this, can't prove this. There's no 
experiment to run on this. It's just the story that's believed. The Bible says there's no room for such thinking in a biblical worldview because everything functions, as I've been saying, according to its kind. This is the parameters that is set within a species. There can be variation, there will be changes, there will be adaption, but it will never go beyond its kind. It will always stay within those parameters. And now something brand new has taken place. Verse 22. God blessed them. He's not done this with any of creation. He now blesses them. This is how he blessed them. Saying, be fruitful and multiply. Now this, again, is brand new. Now flowers that he already created, plants, they can replicate. But they can't replicate without, they can't do this on their own. Okay? There's no means that they need the wind, they need a bird, they need a bee. You know the story. They can only create seeds. Some of them can self-replicate. Some of them have the ability for pollen and stamen and all the rest to happen on its own. But not all plants. They need something else. But now these creatures have a self-replication built right in. Now, I don't know if you can imagine how complex this is in just a simple few words here. We don't really think about this too often. Think about the possibility of a self-replicating machine. For example, imagine your car, when you buy the car, you are told this will be the last car you ever have to buy. Because built into this machine is a mechanism for it to forge metal, create oil, mold rubber, put all the pieces in place, and one day you'll come into your garage and there will be another car that it builds out of itself, by itself. It has the means to self-replicate its own machine. Is that ludicrous? We take this system so for granted we don't even think about how unbelievably complex we're talking about. These things can make themselves and all of the machinery that is necessary, all the hardwire that is necessary for this to happen is built into them, and the instinct to do so is built into them. And now, this is the last time God creates fish. He says, now, you go and make your own fish. This is the last time God creates birds. Now, he says, you go make your own birds. He set it in place and gave it a self-replicating device so that it would constantly, constantly be replenishing itself. This is a fascinating piece of machinery, just reproduction in itself from these kinds. And every single one of them has a different system. The seahorse even, for example, the male seahorse gives birth to babies. I'm pretty sure God did that just to mess with your head. Build their waters in the seas. Let the birds multiply on the earth. That's what he's pronounced to them. He's given them this mandate. I've created you for the purpose of filling and self-replicating. Now do that. And he set them loose to do that. This is what we read. Genesis 1, verse 23. And there was evening. And there was morning. The fifth day. How you read this text will be dependent on your worldview. How you read this text will be dependent on your understanding of God. How you want to see this text will be a reflection of the God you believe in. Do you believe in a God that is so powerful, that is so mighty, that all he needs is to speak the words and it is so? Do you believe in a God who can do the impossible, that there is nothing so great that he cannot do. And he has demonstrated this from the very beginning by speaking species and beings into being that can self-replicate with incredible complexity. Every single one of them, from nothing to everything, instantly. Is that your God? Or do you believe in a God that has created everything but needs time, that has made a system that somehow needs to, he's got to step back and it's now running its course. 
And he's himself maybe even curious what it's going to find out. Or maybe you believe he's sticking his finger in once in a while and he's helping things along and he's guiding things along. Is that your God? That's not the God as he's presented in Genesis. This is a God who spoke, let there be out of nothing, but ah, and there was. The God of the Bible is an all-powerful God. Who do you worship? 